Sure. Hi, everyone. It's, it's great to be able to spend some time with you today. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Rachel Harwitz, and I'm the president and CEO of Caribou Bio. Caribou is a startup company here in the Bay Area. We're based in Berkeley, and we're a team of about 65 people. What we do at Caribou is use a technology called CRISPR to edit the genome. So if you're not familiar with this, genome editing is basically the ability to go inside of living cells and precisely change DNA sequences. Um, it's an incredibly cool technology, I think, um, and one that's really changing the shape of how many different kinds of products are developed. At Caribou, we specifically focus on how to use CRISPR genome editing to make new potential medicines for cancer. And in particular, we harness the power of the immune system by actually taking immune cells, editing their DNA, and then using that as a, as a cell therapy product. And these cells are able to actually find and hopefully kill cancer cells in a patient's body. Um, prior to here, I was in academia. So I have an undergraduate degree from Harvard, a PhD uh, just down the street at, at UC Berkeley. And we actually founded Caribou out of the lab where I did my PhD. One of my co-founders at Caribou is Dr. Jennifer Doudna. You may have heard of her recently. Last year, she won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for CRISPR, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and if you're looking for a very long but very interesting book to read, I highly recommend Codebreaker, which just came out uh, maybe a month or two ago. It's really her story, uh, written by a very famous author named Walter Isaacson. So I'm excited to share with you some of what we're doing and, and to get to chat with so many of these fantastic women. And I look forward to your questions today. Thank you, Rachel. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Kinkari Mitra, and I am a senior vice president of uh, development sciences at Genentech. Um, for those of you in the Bay Area, Genentech is a very familiar name. Um, it's uh, kind of the pioneer in the biotech industry. Um, and, you know, I've been very fortunate um, to be part of the journey of Genentech for uh, 24 years now. Um, and so really feel like a long time Genentecher. Genentech is, uh, while it's a biotech and started as a biotech, is now part of a bigger pharmaceutical company called Roche, which is um, a company that's actually international. It's based in Basel in Switzerland. Now, um, Genentech, you know, in the, my long journey at Genentech has been focused on the discovery and development of drugs, um, mostly what I call targeted th therapies, which is really making treatments that are targeted to specific biological you know, receptors or targets. And then furthermore, to personalized treatments, which is really getting treatments to the right patients. And I, I believe in the tagline of the, the right drug to the right patient at the right dose. And this is the sort of concept um, that we work on and that I work on as part of development sciences. And so I'm involved, my team is involved all the way from early discovery of our molecules and candidates throughout the entire drug development process. We've, I've been part of the development of many successful drugs that are already on the market, much of which are in the treatment of cancer, uh, but also in areas of immunology like um, asthma, um, neuroscience, muscular, um, scl um, multiple sclerosis, um, and a number of other areas, even treating diseases of the eye. So I'm happy to tell you more about my journey. But once again, I came to Genentech also from academia. I did my PhD at UCSF and also my postdoctoral fellowship, as well as a fellowship in clinical pharmacology from UCSF. Great. Katerina? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Katerina Kasoglu. I'm a professor of neurology uh, at uh, UCSF and a senior investigator at uh, the Gladstone Institute and also a director of the uh, newly uh, founded uh, Gladstone UCSF Center for Neurovascular Brain Immunology. Uh, the research interests uh, in my lab uh, focus on uh, the role of blood proteins in neurological diseases. Uh, this uh, research started from uh, really our curiosity 
on uh, the uh, based on the observation of the leak of blood proteins in the brain uh, uh, across uh, several neurological diseases, including uh, those with autoimmune origin, like multiple sclerosis or neurodegenerative diseases, mm -hmm. um, as well as also trauma. And uh, what uh, we found is that uh, uh, when bl these blood proteins leak in the brain, they're actually causal uh, to disease pathogenesis. And um, we developed uh, both, uh, um, uh, as we were understanding the uh, functions of this in the brain, uh, both uh, an imaging platform to be able to image these, uh, these, uh, these uh, functions uh, in brain diseases, but also um, uh, novel ways to target them, uh, therapeutic targeting uh, in, uh, uh, in the brain. Uh, so we're very excited uh, to be able to uh, take uh, this research from this uh, basic uh, observations uh, um, all the way to potentially uh, developing new tools uh, that uh, uh, could be uh, very important uh, for uh, these pathways that are, appear to be a common thread for devastating uh, neurological uh, diseases. Um, before, uh, I, I've, I've had now my lab here for 13 years at UCSS. Uh, but uh, I started from uh, uh, Athens, Greece. Uh, I was born. Uh, uh, I was born in Athens, uh, and uh, um, I did my PhD in immunology at the University of Athens. Uh, and then uh, um, I continued uh, uh, with uh, training in neuropathology at the University of Vienna. And then I did uh, two postdoctoral fellowships in New York uh, at the Rockefeller University and New York University. And I started my first lab in La Jolla at UCSD at the Department of Pharmacology. And uh, then I've moved to the Bay Area uh, now where um, uh, my lab uh, resides. And I'm uh, truly excited to be here and uh, uh, very excited about this uh, panel. Thank you. And Grace. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. My name is Grace Colon. I'm originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico, where I grew up and completed all my schooling through high school. I did, a, I, my background is a chemical engineer, as a chemical engineer, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I did my PhD at MIT in Boston, and then I did a postdoc there as well. So while I studied chem chemical engineering, um, since I was a freshman in college, I spent a lot of time doing research in biotech. I was working in the mid 80s in the early field of genetic engineering, <laughs> way before CRISPR had been discovered, a sort of very rudimentary tools that we had back there. And I did research like that throughout undergrad and grad, which, which was really exciting to me, um, combining the principles of both biology, but also engineering. And uh, I've spent my career in a variety of parts of biotech. So I've been at a company called Affymetrix, which made these um, genetic chips that could actually read expression levels uh, of, of various proteins in, in cells. And, and I also spent many years at a company called Gilead Sciences, you've probably heard of, um, in the Bay Area um, in a variety of roles, including developing strategy for some of their ar therapeutic areas like HIV and hepatitis, as well as um, running the clinical operations group there. And then beyond that, I also spent time at a company called um, Intrexon, where I built a, a whole division focused on actually engineering various types of cell types. So everything from fungus to bacteria, um, and yeast to try to develop uh, interesting compounds from renewable resources such you know using basically making biofuels and high value chemicals. Uh, but for the last 10 years or so I've been in the startup world. So I've been a partner at a venture capital world leading an venture capital um, firm leading investments in various types of biotech companies um, and also started a couple of companies. Uh, my current role is as CEO of a company called Incarta Therapeutics. It's an early stage company. Uh, we're, we're about 25 people right now. And we're developing various novel treatments for cardiopulmonary conditions. The first treatment we're working on is um, a treatment for something called atrial fibrillation, which is a very common type of heart arrhythmia that actually has a significant unmet need because it's not treated as well as it could be in the early stages. It's actually a progressive condition. And every time um, someone's heart gets into this abnormal rhythm, you're actually causing a little bit of damage to the heart and it progresses. And it could actually have some serious consequences such as stroke. And so what we're doing is, is really a combination of engineering and um, you know, trying novel ways of developing ex or delivering existing drugs, drugs that have been well studied. And so the benefits and risk of the drugs are well understood, but actually delivering them through inhalation so that the drug goes directly through the lung 
and absorb rapidly into the bloodstream and gets to the heart within minutes. So therefore this approach will have potentially the benefit of uh, treating every time an episode happens, treating it very quickly and minimizing the time that the heart is in a state of arrhythmia and hopefully bring a lot of benefit to patients. We're, we've advanced this quite a bit and we're got, about to go into final, uh, what's called phase three trials after which we can submit for approval of this treatment um, to the FDA. And then we also have a pipeline of other drugs. And um, you know we're very excited about this. There's a lot of excitement in the patient community about what we're developing. Um, and we can answer more questions about that later, but um, thanks for, for having me here today. Really excited to speak to you all. Thank you all. What amazing research everybody is, is doing. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of us have nonlinear paths to where we are today. And something we would love to hear from each of you is when, when you were in high school, what did you want to be? Are you doing that today? And maybe share some of the, the barriers you may have faced along the way and help us understand was your path linear or, you know, was it more circuitous as it often is? And Katarina, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Great question. So uh, when I was in high school, so um, uh, I'm a first generation to college. Uh, so uh, it was, um, I was not very much exposed in science uh, as a career uh, uh, path or study path. Um, and actually, it was at high school when uh, um, it was my high school biology teacher uh, who really inspired me uh, to uh, follow uh, studies in uh, science, and she really connected the dots for me of how it's possible to take this uh, curiosity I always had uh, about being a scientist to actually connect the dots and be able to build it into a studies, uh, a course of studies, uh, and later into a career path. And uh, it was uh, some very important experiences that I had very early as an undergraduate. I was a biology major. Uh, the first time I had an internship, a summer internship in a, in a lab. Uh, it was uh, a, an amazing experience. I started by washing Eliza plates. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I knew right then that uh, this is what I would be pursuing in my life. So it's so important uh, to have this, uh, uh, I think, early experiences of exposure really in the lab uh, research because it's really unique when you can take to get, you can uh, integrate um, what uh, you think uh, from a scholarly level that uh, you're thinking about science can be when you actually have this first hands on experience that I think is really fascinating when you can do that. So for me, this was a life changing moment when uh, uh, I, I walked into a lab and uh, they gave me the first experiment uh, to do. Um, after that, of course, uh, my, the, my, my path further from that was always science driven. Every move I had made, I followed the science. Uh, so during my graduate work, I, I found those uh, uh, very striking immune mechanisms that for the first time changing the immune system in the brain was causing neurological disease. I was so fascinated to find out how this would start. So I pursued a postdoc uh, in a lab that I thought would take me to the next path. So all my all all the all my moves from uh, Athens to Austria to the U.S. was uh, all basically by following the science. So for me that was a, a key driver in uh, in uh, in how my path uh, uh, my path uh, uh, my path uh, uh, formed. And um, about barriers that you're asking, I think. One of the key barriers was um, uh, many times uh, we asked uh, uh, in, in, in our research many really high risk uh, questions uh, for which uh, um, it was not, uh, I think, simple to be able to put together the resources uh, for this type of um, high risk and hopefully potentially high reward research. So one of the main barriers or challenges was uh, you know, to piece together an ecosystem of funding that uh, uh, would be able to balance uh, our uh, uh, research programs and uh, give us, you know, the resources that uh, are needed uh, to pursue sometimes some uh, more out of the box uh, ideas. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I would say that you know when I was in high school, I think the one thing I definitely knew is that I loved science and math. Um, if, if I was to say, did I know what I would be doing today? Probably not. 
but I knew that these um, were a very, very interesting subjects to me. And I focused a lot on that at the, at the cost of some other, other subjects that weren't that interesting to me. Um, now, but I also feel like my career was a lot of like hit and misses. Um, I thought I wanted to go in a particular direction and then I would hit a roadblock and, and then that was not the direction and so I would move a little bit differently. So when I studied, I actually uh, forgot to mention this earlier, but my undergraduate education was in India um, and I came um, to America as a graduate student. Now, when I was in India, I loved science and I thought I was going to go into medical school and become a doctor and that was sort of the, the goal I had. Um, but um, I, at some point that it real, I realized that was not what I wanted to do. And so it, it was sort of like working towards it and then realizing, well, you know, that's actually not what I want to do. Uh, but I was very, very interested in medicine. So if, if, if anything is a single thread for me, it is follow the medicine and the science. And so with this love for medicine, I actually went into um, a pharmacy school with the intent to understand how drugs, you know, everything about medicines, about drugs and what, how they work, what they do in the body, et cetera. When I finished my bachelor's, I decided that was not enough. I really wanted to do pharmaceutical research. I wanted to understand what goes behind, how the drug interacts with the body, what the body does to the drug, et cetera. And sort of the hero of the movie was actually really the drug um, and, and what its role is in terms of everything it can do uh, for patients, as well as how your body interacts with drugs. This love for uh, medicine and for drugs is what pushed me into becoming a pharmacologist. When I first came to the US to graduate school, I actually started at the University of Texas at Austin. I would say I was very young. I didn't know exactly what area of discipline within, uh, within pharmacology I wanted to do my PhD in or my master's in. And after spending a year there, I realized this, the, the specific topic I was gonna work on with my professor there wasn't of great interest to me. This is when I moved to UCSF, uh, which is where I found my true love in working on drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics. That is what happens to drugs when you, when you dose them in the body. How does the body treat them? Where does it go? How do you get drugs to its site of action? Um, this is where it took me down the path of really understanding pharmacology, really getting into drug discovery and drug development. And then since then I followed my path, uh, which led me into industry. While my love for teaching always wanted me to think about academia as a profession, I continue to be a adjunct professor at UCSF, which, which sort of helps me, um, you know, allows me to stay, you know, very connected to the academic disciplines and also be teaching and mentoring um, students at the same time. So, um, so this is how my path has progressed. It's never, it's not quite been a straight path. It's been kind of go move forward, learn from it, and and then and then decide uh, whether it's the right course for me or not. Absolutely, I think that's a common thread through most for most of us. Uh, Grace, how about you? Um, sure, thanks. So back in high school, I think you'll, you're going to hear us repeating this. I think, uh, you know, I always loved science and math. I had a lot of other interests as well. I, I, I participated in Model UN, went to Washington and, and did debates and all that. Um, I did a lot of singing and performing, but, but science and math in terms of what I wanted to do as a career were always there. And I was fortunate to grow up on a beautiful tropical island that was very lush. And from a, being, you know, since I was very young, I just loved the variety of life down there, whether it be at the beach, you know, snorkeling and seeing all the, the fish or lizards. I always loved iguanas. <laughs> so I grew up just loving animals. And I also happened to grow up loving science fiction. In the countryside in Puerto Rico, you know, sometimes where there's not a lot of light or if we were visiting neighboring islands, because um, it was pretty easy to do, it's very dark at night and you can see so many stars and so many constellations and galaxies in the Milky Way. And I used to read a lot of science fiction. So I, I thought I wanted to be an astronaut or an astrophysicist. And I still read a lot of science fiction. I still, I think sci-fi can, 
can sort of set out a sense of wonder and possibility um, in its most positive form. And so I, I always had that inclination, but probably when I was in high school is when I really started to understand about engineering and what it was. I sort of met people who had been engineers. And then I realized my, both my grandfathers were engineers. I hadn't really thought about it. One of them I had never met, um, the one from Puerto Rico, my dad's side. Um, I never met him, he died before I was born, but he was involved in the early days in Puerto Rico of the sugarcane industry. He was also a chemical engineer. And I didn't realize that until I had chosen chemical engineering. Um, and he was involved in all the sugar processing plants all over the island. And then my other grandfather was an electrical engineer. And I used to go visit him in New Orleans in the summer and read his old engineering books. I know, I was really nerdy. <laughs> and he, he was an electrical engineer and helped build the power grid in New Orleans. So I also liked that part, but I was more drawn towards chemical engineering. Um, and, and as to kind of career choices from there, it, it really was driven by always a sense of passion and excitement about the possibilities. Every time I made a change from one place to another, and that's what I would sort of, that's one message I would impart is, is follow your heart. You don't have to have the, the career all laid out, but, you know, at every step, I sort of would look one or two steps ahead and say, now I want to learn about genomics. And there's some really exciting things happening in genomics. Around the time I joined Affymetrics, the human genome had just been sequenced. And so it was opening up a huge set of discoveries that went on to make a lot of difference in cancer. And then beyond then, I went to Gilead at a time that was, they were making a really phenomenal impact on the lives of HIV patients. And they were the first ones to come up with a single pill once a day for HIV patients, which made a dramatic difference in the survival and life, lifetime of those patients because the ability to, to not have to take, they used to have to take many different pills at several times a day, which is really hard to, to, stay, to be able to do that continuously and stay on track. So every time I went somewhere, it was always like, oh, they're doing something really cool over there. And I've learned something at my prior job that could actually be useful here, but I can also learn some new things. And, and that's sort of a common theme every time I made a shift. So as long as you start with something that you find really exciting and never lose that sense of wonder about it, you can sort of set a, a compass in a certain direction but it's okay if the wind knocks you about a little bit, then you set a new direction and you go that way. And um, you know that's sort of how I did my career the whole time. I, I never would have known that I'd be here today doing what I'm doing right now. I didn't even know sort of anything about startups or therapeutics or anything. I just, at each juncture, followed what excited me and also wanted to learn new things. And, and that's sort of how I went from step to step. Absolutely. Oh, barriers. Okay. So yeah. barriers, it's always hard because you always take risks. Um, I know getting, um, you know, growing up in Puerto Rico, I had a, a good education, but when I arrived at a, at a top school like Penn and then MIT, I realized I was way behind most everybody else. I didn't have advanced AP courses. I didn't have, you know, a lot of the advantages. I had to do a work study. We didn't have the means to pay for it. So it forced me to, to work all the time and then get home late at night and have to do my homework. So I was always behind, never had great grades but I in, in college, but I persisted. And because I had to work, I chose work study and research. And that enabled me to publish papers at an early age and learn things that then enabled me to go to a top school like MIT for grad school. So I think take, see each barrier as an opportunity and believe in yourself. And, and muddle through, it's not gonna be easy. I mean, I've failed at things before. I've you know lost jobs or had projects that failed. I started a company that failed, um, but here I am. You, know, you, you learn from each experience and you, you just keep on going. And I think it just makes you stronger. Absolutely. And I, we're gonna circle back to something because we have, we have a lot of really great questions coming in. So I'll let Sarah, I'll have, or, sorry, Rachel, uh, we'll move to you next and then we're gonna switch over to some questions that'll feed in nicely into this conversation we're having. Yeah, so I, I think I was in middle school when I first realized that science could be a career. I, I had never really understood that before. Um, my father was a, a journalist. He wrote for newspapers for 45 years and he mostly covered science and the environment. And one summer he got the chance to take some classes at the Marine Biological Laboratory um, on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. We were living in Texas at the time and, and we were uh, able to go with him for a few weeks, my brother and my mother and I. And so while he was in classes all day, 
my mom would just grab my brother and me and walk us around the Institute campus and wander in. And many of the researchers were very kind and, and took time to explain to us what they were doing. And I just thought it was incredible that you could get paid to ask interesting questions and then try to answer them. Um, and so it, that really got me interested in the idea of, of science and, and research as a career. And then I landed in high school and my freshman biology teacher was, I would say to this day, the toughest teacher I have ever had. And that includes degrees at Harvard and, and UC Berkeley. <laughs> incredibly high expectations for us. And one of the things we had to do was design and carry out our own experiment. I went to a public high school in Austin, Texas that did not have a lot of resources. So that meant we had to do that at home. And I, I ended up reading in one of my mother's college textbooks, there was this theory that planaria, these tiny little flatworms that live in water might actually store some of their memories as RNA molecules. They also happen to be cannibals. So there was the idea that perhaps they could gain each other's memories by eating each other. I thought that was pretty cool. So I ended up with about 400 planaria on the family dining room table. And I taught a bunch of them the maze, chopped them up and fed them to the others to try to answer that question. Long story short, I have no idea. It, it was inconclusive to say the least. But it, it really gave me an excitement for science being a way to spend my time. Um, and I'll say in general, I, I love to think about how we're exposed to science all the time, not just when I'm at work. Um, so I, I challenge any of you to try to figure out what the virtual background is behind me. Feel free to, to throw your guesses into the chat. I'll let you know if someone gets it right. Um, I think it's just a wonderful example of, of the beauty of, of, of nature and, and science. Um, but I think much like the, the other three women have shared, so many of my decisions have just been based on what I was interested in. You know, I, I thought when I was in college that I wanted to be an attorney when I grew up, but I loved the science I was doing so much. I figured whatever, I'll go to graduate school and do the science thing for a while and, and figure out the rest of this as this moves on. And that's really just governed uh, really every decision I've made since then. And yes, you guys do far more produce shopping than I did at your age. I'm incredibly impressed. It is a watermelon radish. Fantastic. <laughs> so we have some questions coming in regarding how do you get exposure in high school, especially as somebody who is in their teens, 15, 16, 17, with no professional experience. Where do you start? How do you get that first experience in a lab, into science? Just you know, get your foot in the door. And open it up to whomever would like to take the first crack at that. I would just like to say, I wish I were a young person now. <laughs> there are so many resources, not only for obvious reason, everybody wants to be young again, but all kidding aside, I think just the, the plethora of resources available online and, and elsewhere for young people to learn, you know, online courses, um, newsletters, journals, you know, open access journals, there, there's, there's a wealth of information. Now, the key is how do, you, how do you get guidance? And I think we'll probably go into that a little bit later when we talk about things like mentorship. But I think in terms of the raw materials to follow your own interests and learn a lot, and to be able to even do your own biohack experiences, Rachel, I love your story. You know, there's, there's just a lot, a lot of things. So finding, learning more about your area of interest, you know, taking the time to read, to go online, to reach out to people who may be experts in the field, you'd be very surprised at how willing people are to do a 15 minute conversation if you go prepared and have very specific questions. And then from each person you learn something and keep a list of questions and keep building off of that. So I do think that there are a lot of opportunities. Keep in mind also that in high school, there are opportunities at universities to do summer programs as well. I benefited when I was um, in high school, I went to what was called the MITES program at MIT. When I was a junior in high school, I found out about it and it was focused on, it was called Minority Introduction Engineering. And as a Latina, I was able to, you know, they, they went to Puerto Rico and um, had information there for us to apply. And I, I, it, was, it just blew my mind. I went to MIT for four weeks stayed on campus, took courses in science and engineering and math and English even, writing for scientists. 
And it just, I just fell in love with it. We did all kinds of experiments and things. So I think there are programs out there and there's always, um, you know, um, either, you know, financial aid available or scholarships as well. And, and there's a plethora of them available now, not just MIT. I remember Georgia Tech has one too. And many, many, many other universities have programs where you can do, you know, in-person online courses. So there are there are a ton of resources and, and it's not, you're never too young to learn and start learning about a field of passion and then start looking, you know, by the time you're in 10th grade or, or junior or even before, start look start looking at universities that might interest you um, to go to college. Look at their programs, look at coursework that they offer and, and read about kind of programs and read what some of the professors are doing and some of their research areas. So I think there's a lot of things, um, if you're motivated, there's a lot of things you can do. And I'll shut up now. I'd love my co-panelists to, to chime in on this. Katerina, do you want to speak maybe to how you, how did you get that first lab experience over, over the drivers there? Yeah, so uh, I think in, uh, in, in my case, uh, uh, I was uh, an undergrad. I was in my first year uh, as an undergrad and I uh, was, as I said, a biology major. And uh, I, I was very much interested to start working in, in a lab uh, and have this experience, but it was, uh, I didn't really know where, where to begin. And it was actually my high school teacher who uh, connected me with a, a lab uh, at the Hellenic Pasteur Institute that was an immunology lab. And I spent there the whole summer. Uh, so I, when uh, you know, school finished, uh, I spent the whole summer at an immunology, uh, at an immunology lab. But uh, definitely her help and support was instrumental to be able to get me this experience. Of course, this was 30 plus years ago. So uh, clearly the programs that are available now that uh, Grace very nicely outlined uh, was not uh, then in place. Uh, there wasn't even internet for us to be able to search for opportunities like this. So everything had to be through word of mouth and uh, the networking was very, very different than uh, the way it can be done now. So uh, definitely university programs, uh, even those that might not be directly targeted to, towards high school uh, students, but uh, uh, undergraduate students. Uh, for example, at Gladstone, we have the Pumas uh, undergraduate internship uh, uh, program. These are paid fellowships for throughout the summer. Reaching out to the directors of those programs, they can be excellent resources uh, for also uh, opportunities that might not be at the graduate level, but also at the high school level. So the directors of uh, the undergraduate summer programs uh, are there to help and uh, they're there to be able to connect uh, students with uh, research labs. So they, I'm sure they would be uh, delighted to answer questions on how uh, to, what, what would be uh, possible and available for uh, um, uh, students at uh, different levels of uh, training, either uh, high school or undergraduate or uh, senior uh, um, uh, in college. And that is an excellent segue into our next question. Um, so mentorship is so important throughout any time of our career, finding a sponsor, somebody to champion you. Uh, let's, let's, Sarah, why don't we start with you? How, how would you recommend students approach mentorship or reaching out to people to help support them throughout their careers? Yeah, you know, I, so I'm a believer that mentors, um, you know, you don't have to be part of a very formal mentoring program, although there are mentoring programs in different places, even at Genentech, you know, we have a program just for Genentech women in science and engineering, and it's a, a program that allows for women to connect. We have a mentoring program for employees in our organization. There are mentoring programs outside also, but Throughout my career, if I felt that someone could be a good mentor for me based on either something they're doing or some way that they're they're doing what they're doing that I would like to learn from, or they would be a good connector for me, or they could advise me from time to time. Um, you know, even early in my career, I've just reached out to people. Now it's possible that some of those people don't get back to you, but then many people actually would be very willing um, to connect with young people and give them advice. Now that doesn't mean you have to have a formal meeting every month or every week or whatever, but that they're there for you if you if you wanted to chat from time to time needed some advice, et cetera, 
Uh, I've got several uh, mentees who just connect me with me at different parts of their decision making and and say, here's how I'm thinking about things. How would you advise? Uh, and I, I'm more than happy to to advise them because it's really amazing, um, you know, when you are at this part of your career to actually help someone that's early in their career. And one gets to learn a lot because the world, as you just heard from Grace, is not the same. When we were growing up, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have all these tools, these amazing ability to access information that you have at your fingertips. We would actually have to go and find the library that had the book that actually, you know, that you could read to find something. So you are far more connected and your ability to actually reach out and find people and ask them if they would be mentors is much, much greater than, than I could do 30 years ago. I can guarantee you that. So um, so I think, I think I'd just say my advice is if you find a, someone that you admire or that could be an instant, and maybe you won't become just like them, but just something about what they've done that's inspiring you, just reach out to them. You know, the worst thing that can happen is they don't have time right now for you. And they may say, I'll talk to you in a year. So, and that's okay. Grace, is there anything you would like to add? I think Sarah covered it beautifully, and I do think that that's exactly right. You'd be amazed at how how people are willing to to talk. I, I talk to people all the time that reach out to me, um, and we just grab thirty minutes and and I try to help them. You know, I can't promise that I can meet with them every week and guide their whole career, but I think sometimes all it takes is a sounding board, someone to guide you. As we said, there's this wealth of information. So now that's the other problem. There's so much information. Where do you start? That's where talking to people can help, and talking to multiple people. And the advice I would give people always is, is keep in mind that people are super busy and they're willing to spend their time, but you can help them by coming very prepared. Doesn't mean you have to know a lot, but to know a little bit about them first. So you know the context, know where they are, read their LinkedIn profiles. And so join LinkedIn, if you're never too, too young to join LinkedIn. I had my son who's a, my oldest, who's a junior in college, I had him join in high school so he could start building his profile and connecting to people. Um, and then come prepared with very specific questions. So that person can can feel helpful. They want to feel helpful. And they're going to be they're going to be they're going to not feel as helpful if you just come with kind of one big general question. If you say, hey, I'm really interested in the following things. What kind of careers might be open to me for that? Or I've seen that you went from going over here to doing that. How did you do that? Walk me through that. Or how did you make your decision to study? So come with a list of questions and 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 don't be afraid to just ask them and open up and then find several people so you can get a lot of opinions because no one person is going to know everything. Um, and then build on what you learned. Uh, and, and then and then always get back. One thing that I love is when people get get out, get back to me a year later, five years later, thank you so much for speaking to me back then. This is what I did, I'm now here. And it just gives me this huge pleasure to know that this person has gone on and followed their passions and that maybe I gave them one small piece of advice or at least inspired them and encouraged them. So it's a two way street. You know, when you ask for something, think about what that person wants in return. That person wants to know that they've been helpful and they wanna see you succeed. People really want to help people. Um, so that's important. And then the other thing I should mention real quick is that there are mentors, but there's also, as you go in, in your college career and then beyond, and even in high school and earlier, there's, there's other things, other types of people called sponsors or champions. And these are the people who um, will really take an interest, maybe someone who works at your company who is more senior, who's looking out for you, who you can go to for advice, who can maybe guide you towards certain, putting a good word for you to guide you towards certain types of projects or opportunities, and who will always kind of be, vouch for you and say, this person is, I've seen them grow, this is what they can do. Think of them for the next opportunity or the next promotion or working in a new department. And likewise, a champion is someone who stays with you throughout your career, who is really looking out for you big picture, even across companies. Um, so those are important relationships too. And, and they, it happens organically. It's not like you can go to somebody and say, will you be my sponsor? If you go somewhere and do your best, you will meet people who will naturally want to sponsor you and champion you. And these, these are relationships that you should treasure throughout your career. Excellent. So we are right at time, 5.30. Amazing job, everyone. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you, huge thank you for the panel. This was so inspiring. I learned 
I learned a lot today and I have no doubt that our students did as well. Um, just as a reminder, if you're interested in more of our programming, definitely sign up so that we can make sure you get all of our events, check out our event website. And we do have an ambassador program, which is where um, we Young Women in Bio work directly with young women who are interested in continuing their careers in STEM. So if that's something you're interested in, I put the link in the chat box. Definitely take a look at the application, check out our Instagram page, and you can learn more about what it is that we do.